Wai wai Māori a hau. Ti hei wā mō i ora. Just going to speak a little bit of English. I have a karakia here, um, which I hope it's okay to um, present to you this evening. This is the first time this has been read out uh, to an audience. And the reason for that is because I wrote it last night, <laughs> believe it or not. And I thought this might be. Um, <clears throat> Well, I actually wrote this for my whanau, who have been asking me to write some karakia for them. And I thought this could also be used somewhere else, and I'd forgotten about tonight, so if I could share that with you, I'd really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. I, I will adjust it slightly, and I'll, I'll translate it. <coughs> no reira. Kei ino i tata. I ta atoa, kei runga rā. Nao i tiaki, au mātou tūpuna. Nao i mōhio ki ngā whakapāwera rātou i whakatau mahatia. Nā tō aroha ki a rātou me tau manaki mātou e ora ai. I whakawhetai ana mātou i āhoi, nā te mea, no Aotearoa mātou. I reira, <coughs> ka inoi au mātou tūpuna i runga i tō ingoa, ka mōhio mātou ki tēnei. Wai ngari e mātou ka hono mai ki Aotearoa, nā te take. Nō reira, whakapāngia mātou e tātua, a whakapono tia e mātou i a koe. Amen. So just translate that. Let us pray, dear Lord up above. You looked down, you looked after our ancestors. You knew their tribulations. You knew that they suffered. It was through your love and caring for them that we live today. We thank you. We thank you because we are from Aotearoa. And there, in this place, our ancestors prayed in your name. We know this. We are lucky to be connected to Aotearoa, for you are the reason. Therefore, please bless us, dear Lord, as our faith is in you. Amen. 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 Tai mai i te pō nei uh, ki te whakahamore tia, uh, te whakaatua o te uh, manuhire uh, rangatira ki takutahe te pāna ki te kaupapa wewi mātauranga Māori into science teaching in a Christian school in a holistic way through engagement with special character. And then, ki a koe e te rangatira nō mai haru mai, nō mai haru mai. A ki a koe e Nicola, uh, e mihi, uh, Aroha ki a koe mō tō mahi uh, i mua i, 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 I te pō nei. Mahi uh, winga wera. Uh, nō reira e te tumaki o te, o te uh, whare karakia nei, uh, he mehi ki a koe hoki. Nō reira, uh, uh, kuia, nā kuia, nā kō, mā, Thank you. Ko <laughs> Um, I've just given you my kitaha 
and uh, you're very honoured. It's the very first time I've ever seen you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I must confess, I've always felt a little nervous about that. And in fact, before I go any further, I want to give you three reasons why you should not listen to me. The first is I have no whakapapa with Māori. I am Pākehā. Um, and my whakapapa, as uh, I said in the, the opening there, um, so, sorry. Um, well, I just found my way through this, there we go. Uh, yeah. uh, my ancestry goes back to Ireland. Uh, in fact, it can be traced back to about 820 AD to a king in Connacht. So mm -hmm. I'm thinking of going back and putting my land claim to us. I don't think we'll get very far. Um, at least that's where the name Clary comes from. And maybe that's part of uh, why I do feel a certain affinity in that direction. Perhaps more on that later. Um, my pepeha is not the traditional one because I uh, was not raised with any particular mountain, with any particular awa, uh, with anything. I could uh, <coughs> refer to the fact that I spent some time travelling in the Waitakere Ranges or that uh, I have kayaked on um, the Waitakere Ranges. It somehow seems to trivialise it. So I have opted for that PPH because um, and excuse me, I have bought myself, like Linda did last week, a little uh, sort of uh, security blanket, miners' box. Um, so these are merely here so that the emanations from them can keep me on track. But there is one I thought I might put attention to. If you're lucky enough in this audience, this is a really good book for helping you to engage with um, the Kanga Māori, etc. Kerry, or five. Um, uh, he does a very ironic approach, he, um, it's good, and uh, I've learned a lot from reading that. Um, so, I'm a born Red Aucklander, uh, I attended university here, this was back in the day when there was only Auckland University to attend in Auckland, none of those upstart interlopers. <laughs> Uh, that has sprung up in the last uh, several decades. Um, I spent three years doing a Bachelor of Science, only to not pass it, because in my third year I spent far too much time here, in this room, um, uh, rather than studying. And as a consequence, the following year, I, in order to get the bursary, the magnificent sum the government paid in those days of $13 per week, which was quite a bit back then. Um, we are talking 1981. I enrolled in a BA and a BSc conjoint. It was a bit of a scam just so I could finish my BSc. And at the end of that, um, oh, and this is relevant to my story and perhaps where this comes from, uh, part of the papers I did, some of the papers I did, involved uh, <coughs> That they were in the arts. They were philosophy, uh, did a couple of philosophy papers, a Latin paper, um, anthropology paper that I pulled out of that was a bit boring. Um, and yeah, it was, a, it was a great year. It started to open up something for me. It, it's relevant here because um, I'm actually speaking into an area that I am not well trained in. So here's my second reading. You should listen to me. I, <laughs> I'm not really an academic. I have done a master's in uh, physics here at Auckland University. Um, but again, I did spend a little bit too much time talking and hanging around here rather than doing it as well as I probably could have. So it's, it's an okay master's, but I'm not going to tell you what level of okay it's at. <laughs> um, it was in laser physics, and, and that says something about me. It said my mind enjoyed and went down those paths that uh, have grown out of what we sometimes refer to as Western science, but which had their roots further back. Uh, and I, I particularly enjoyed matters to do with um, 
quantum physics and uh, right down in that really weird realm of matter where things are quite strange. Um, so, but I, I never went any further with it. So I don't have Lyndon's academic qualifications. In fact, many of you in this room are vastly more qualified than I am. Uh, so I'm not an academic. I'm not Maori, I'm not an academic. Um, there was a third reason which uh, I have forgotten, and it's probably another reason, is these days <laughs> I tend to forget a lot of things. So uh, <laughs> bear with me as randomly they come back in and I try to weave them back into things where in fact they should have been further back there. Um, my topic uh, came about because I foolishly sent a link to um, Nicola uh, earlier this year uh, of a talk I had given to my science department, which consists of the sum total of four other people, or five other teachers and myself, um, which I had had to do because I was doing an assignment for a paper that I was part of a master's degree I'm currently undertaking for the Bethlehem Nursery Institute. Now, that paper required me to provide and film myself showing leadership into a particular area of need in the school. And I was at my wits end and suddenly this idea pops in, we really aren't doing the integration of Te Māori, um, Māori Māori into our curriculum very well at the moment. Now part of the problem, of course, is COVID has derailed a lot of things for schools. We've basically been in survival mode for two to three years and we're only just now coming out of that. So if you, if you have children at school or you're hearing about this, it really is that bad. Yesterday, I was telling someone earlier, yesterday for the first time in months, literally months, I had a full class in front of me. And that was only one class. I still have people away in other classes. Kids have become somewhat disengaged. And uh, my school, we're better off than most, we're a school of choice. We are a, a Christian school, uh, so parents deliberately choose to bring their students, to bring, sorry, not their students, their children, to us, hoping we'll do something with them, but heavens knows sometimes. Um, and uh, it, it has been hard. It's been hard for them. So, I think I should just probably move on from that point. Um, you'll notice in the background of my slides here that I have the kōru. Um, that's a very deliberate choice. Um, it was right there at the start when I gave this talk. Um, and uh, my purpose of having it there is, is summarising this quote here um, from the uh, album World. Um, a name I, I've come to appreciate, he, he's written a number of things, and there is one particular book I'm going to draw your attention to that I, I think should be, uh, well, I, I think everyone should read it, but um, yeah. <laughs> this idea that we are rooted in where we have come from, that we're unfolding into something <coughs> new, I think is a very powerful and potent idea for what needs to be happening with the schools. Um, Nicola has asked if I can provide the uh, slides afterwards, so of course I'll be there and you can source that. Um, I don't have the uh, references for some of the quotes, well I do, but uh, I don't actually have them there, but I do have them here and I can send them to you Nicola if people want to yeah. follow up on those. Um, so, I don't think I can really add anything to it. It's, it's a great quote. It does come out of Te Ara, um, the um, online encyclopedia of New Zealand. Um, but um, Charles Boyle has been around for a while now and has written numerous things in the field of Makaonga Māori, Te Ara Māori, as it comes into and intersects with our Pākehā world, or my Pākehā world. Um, so, 
I've, I've let some of my story out, and, and part of my story is that as I have moved through my teaching career, or even when I was here at university, what I didn't realise going on in the background of my story was a problem with epistemology. That is how I knew what I knew and ways of knowing. Now, I, I, I was born uh, late 50s, 1950s, that is not 1850s. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. So, uh, being born at that time, I grew up into a world in uh, New Zealand. Not in Aotearoa, New Zealand, that was tied to Britain until, of course, um, Britain cut the apron strings, etc., further down the track. Um, I grew up in a very white world. I went to a very ordinary secondary school. Um, I don't remember if there were Māori children there or not, but honestly, my world I grew up in was, was Western. Uh, and one of the things I've come to realise as I have got into a bit of extra study, as I've moved into a Christian school and thought I wish to integrate my faith into teaching, is that my outlook was very materialistic. Now, I don't mean that I was um, really grabbing lots of things. It's just that uh, the world I lived in was the material world, and matters spiritual were a separate thing. Um, and even when I went to a Christian school, uh, the, uh, even now, I don't feel like the integration was particularly strong. The materialist ethic that so underpins how our Western civilization operates um, is still sitting there. And it's still, I still find myself coming up against it. Um, and I'm raising that because uh, there is a, I think there's going to be, uh, for many schools throughout Aotearoa, um, particularly ones like mine, where the, the dominant uh, um, clientele uh, comes from the, uh, the white Western world, um, I think there's going to be a, a real um, what's the phrase I want? Um, oh, apologies, it's week seven. I told that to some of you. Week seven means <laughs> that we're three weeks before we go before the end of the term. Um, we've just come through winter. I've been off sick twice this term already. Uh, the, my brain is cottage cheese at the moment. Um, I, I think there's going to be real problems for a number of schools in trying to engage with Tao Māori because what we're effectively saying is integrate something that has a very spiritual element on the world, on life, with something that has a very non-spiritual. It's all about economics. It's all about getting credits. It's all about getting uh, the qualifications so I can move to the next step on the ladder, so I can move to getting the student loan, so I can move to getting the mortgage, so I can... It, it, it's, and that's what I grew up in. And the measure of success was that you went to university, uh, that you got a good job, etc. Um, well, I did one of those. Um, teaching is a good job, so it's not overly well remunerated. Um, unless, of course, you work in a private school um, where they pay you above the salary. Yeah. He's not listening to me. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. I just made a joke at your expense. Um, <laughs> so, as I was studying physics, to go back to my story, this duality, um, my faith here, my physics study here, they didn't really integrate. And in fact, I, uh, I was saying earlier, I wouldn't have gone across to um, or confessed to my fellow master students overly much that I was a Christian. Because immediately that would send up red flags in their mind about ignorance and uh, young earth creationism and a whole host of things that said you couldn't be an honest intellectually thinking person and also hold to some faith position. 
And I didn't really have the resources to actually say anything to them. So I stayed quiet. And I continued to stay quiet for the next 18 years teaching in secular schools. And by secular, I just mean the state, standard state school where uh, one is not allowed to bring a religious perspective into teaching um, unless it's in a particular class that is looking at faith or something, etc. When I move across into a Christian school, I'm now expected to bring that in, and the opposite problem occurs. I don't know how to bring it in. How do you do that? Because I have this purely Western outlook on things. Uh, I can teach you about physics, and I don't have to mention God once. And I did that for 18 years, and now I'm in a school where I have to teach you about physics, but I'm supposed to bring God into it. How do I do that? Now, how is this relevant to Mafra and the Māori? Well, it's basically the same thing. I don't know what they don't know. And that is, I think, going to be the big problem. I fortunately moved from that, at least as far as um, my understanding of uh, faith and how it integrates in, with uh, science and the, the fact that, in fact, there should be no division. Last week, Linda Drake mentioned to you an author by the name of, um, there we are, gone blank. I shouldn't do that because I've been reading a lot of them lately. Alison McGrath. Um, Nicola mentioned in the talk she gave earlier this year uh, a book of his, and we based it around that reinventing nature. Um, and, and was it reinventing nature? No, it was reenchanting. Reenchanting nature. Reinventing nature is another book that's from this book, yes. Um, so, one of the things I think a good talk should be should give you books you should go out and buy. So, if you haven't read Reenchanting Nature, then I do suggest you go and get it. It is out of print, but you can get second hand copies of it. Um, and Alistair McGrath, um, somebody I can relate to because he did his original degree in physics. So, he, he took the true, pure path, uh, all respect to people do genetics and other things. Um, but then he moved across into looking at how science and faith interact and through theology, etc. So uh, he is an author that um, I will be referring to. And people like him and, and many others that I have read through um, have enabled me to transition through the possible doubts <coughs> and uncertainties through to, uh, I think, a much healthier position. And this is, in fact, what schools need to do with Māori Māori, because it um, initially, I think, presents something of an existential threat to the way schools think about things. Um, it even will challenge, I think, the organisational structures that they operate under, um, the power structures. Anyway, so, um, Part of my reading in this early this year was into a, a lovely book produced by Hinamai Elder. And again, this is one that I would strongly recommend. I, I didn't bring it along, but uh, it's in all of the good bookshops. Uh, well, if you consider Wickles a good bookshop. But um, it, it's a collection of Maori proverbs. And um, that one really struck me because what was happening for me wasn't just a little leak and the sails and the lashing or something, my worldview had to shift quite a bit. It was being shaken quite a bit by what I was reading. So um, I have some of the doctor that from Toki. Um, my pronunciation is not feeling confident enough at the moment, so I, I will just let you uh, read that. But some of the people I have been reading uh, here, um, Elsa McGrath, um, is the like at Meek. Um, I've even strayed into reading Jürgen Moltmann. So another reason you shouldn't be listening to me is I'm not a theologian, okay? I I just read them and then reread them and then reread them and reread them because sometimes it's, it takes a bit. Um, but Moltmann has helped me. Uh, his books, God and Creation, and the Trinity and the Kingdom of God, uh, are worth dipping into. Um, Leslie Newbegin uh, is 
probably depends on the area you started reading and etc. But uh, he passed away many years ago now. But uh, well worth reading uh, him as well. And my other most favourite author, who gives me great solace, is John Hawkingwood, because he is a trained physicist. Um, I have to correct him that he, he said he was a theoretical physicist. No, you call him a mathematician. <laughs> um, I nearly did say something last week, but it was dreadful. He wasn't a mathematician, he was a physicist. Um, and uh, um, uh, um, an experimental physicist at that, and he himself confesses his mathematics wasn't up to being a theoretical physicist. But he offers some really good insights into how we can think about science, how we can think about faith, and what is more, how we can engage well with both. So, um, and one of his books is Science and the Trinity, uh, which, as you can tell, probably addresses directly into the part of what I want to say. Because I think it's in the Trinity that we find a way, or at least we can in our Christian school and context, find a way to engage with Mahalonga Māori, which doesn't do damage to Te Ao Māori and uh, to Te Kanga, and doesn't uh, cause too much distort in the science way of thinking. Now, I don't know how this is going to go down well in uh, your standard secular state school, because intrinsically from what I've read, and I, I I'm very happy to be corrected because, as I said, I'm not Māori, I don't bring to kind of with me in, uh, in much respect. Well, I try to bring respect, but I, it just isn't something that sits naturally with me. And what I see is, is Mataranga Māori is a spiritual way of looking at things, as much as it is about physical methods. Um, the, uh, there's just a few other authors there, um, I probably should just click through to them. Uh, the Smiths aren't related, uh, Linda to a boy Smith, um, you need to all know, um, is an academic, and I think she's still based at Waikato. Um, uh, James K. Smith is a Christian sociologist slash philosopher, uh, He's done a lot of writing um, on thinking about um, how God intersects with um, the world. Uh, uh, definitely an academic. Anyway, um, I'm going to skip over that because that isn't the best one. The other author, and I strongly recommend this person to everyone who wishes to try and engage and understand how. Um, <coughs> Matters Māori can come across and intersect with the Western world as Māori master and the Reverend Māori master. Um, his writings were connected together by um, Tarawu, sorry, Ahu Tarawu, Charles Royal, uh, in a book called The Woven Universe, which was out of print. Um, you will have not a lot of joy trying to find a copy, but they should have it libraries, etc. Um, and he, he probably, you would describe him as a Māori Renaissance man. He, he was kind of a white like Leonardo da Vinci. He fought across a whole range of things and his writings are deep. He, he was raised in things Māori, but he was raised in the Christian faith uh, and um, I found a lot to ponder and think about out of him. Um, so I recommend that. Right, I really should move this along because so far this has just been a book review and uh, you don't want a book review. Um, a couple of uh, particular uh, bits of scripture that uh, I feel anger how we should be looking at it are to do with the uh, that passage of John. Now, um, Lyndon Drake mentioned this last week, and I'm um, sitting there last week and hearing Lyndon steal all my best material. So, if this sounds like a repeat, my apologies. Uh, 
this idea that the creation we're in is it's not just made, but it is through Christ. There is this deep intrinsic sense of things being held together. And of course that comes in Corinthians. Now um, I look at something like that and the image there is just uh, my way of trying to say, well, um, you can look at things from different perspectives and see different things, but in the end, you're all looking at the same thing. So as Lyndon again mentioned, um, I adopt a, a critical realist stance. I've sort of come across that in the last few years and realised that's where I sit. Uh, I feel that um, there's a sense where as we engage with muscle and Maori, it's a bit like the wave particle duality in physics. And if you don't know what that is, well, that's something for you to go away and research. Everyone should know about the wave particle duality in physics because at its heart, it's a mystery. What is light? Is it a particle? Well, I can show you. I've got the equipment at my school. I can do an experiment that will show you light as a particle. Not that you can see the particle, but the results can only be interpreted that way. I've also got an equipment at my school which will show you that that very same light is a wave. And you can only interpret the results of that experiment as a wave. Which is it? And the answer is both. It's a mystery. At its heart, quantum physics is, uh, has been driving people bananas for years. Nobody has really settled on what exactly it means. We do know it works, okay? Um, and that's all I'm going to say about it because it's been decades since I engaged with it, really, and I've forgotten so much. Um, so I, there's a sense where uh, when we start to look at who Christ is, uh, how does faith into it accept, is it, I feel like it's sort of hinting at this. The other thing I say is that if we have a Trinitarian God, then I don't believe he could have created, he, excuse the uh, appellation that's what I got raised with, could have created any other universe than one that had the wave particle duality in it. Kind of has to go, goes into territory. Because God is not this or that, God is God. And when you try to silo God into one thing, you kind of lose something. Um, the other aspect, and uh, again, I appeal to quantum physics uh, for a bit of things like this. This verse here, this is one of my mainstays, I think. Um, it suggests that God is currently present here in this room, containing everything, ensuring that it continues to exist. Now, at this point, I'm well aware that I'm in danger of straying over into panentheism. Um, and I, what I would say is, please read Alice McGrath uh, at Reenchantment um, book because he addresses that really well. Um, and uh, I, I side with him as well. I mean, that's high behind him at the moment. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard of the quantum Zeno effect. Um, very briefly, what it means is that. It's literally a uh, quantum physicist's way of saying the watch pot never boils. Um, and it has been experimentally verified that uh, you, if you have something like a system of radioactive particles which will naturally decay at a certain rate, uh, then you watch that system in a particular way using a particular system. And if you want to know more about the details, just Google quantum zero effect and you'll get far more than you ever wanted to. But if you watch it in a particular way, within a certain time, it doesn't decay. Radioactivity doesn't behave like it's supposed to behave. Now that's weird. And it's called the quantum Zeno effect because uh, Zeno was a philosopher who purported to prove that we couldn't actually move anywhere because in order to move somewhere, you've got to move halfway there. And if you can, if you've got to move halfway there, you've got to move quarter of the way there. So you can't get to halfway because you've got to get Quarter, but you can't get to quarter because you have to get away. You follow the reasoning, it's just going down and down to the absurd. Um, of course, it's not true, but the quantum zero effect is. Now, my intent with this talk, and hopefully you've been getting to pick up some of it, is that we have to um, start breaking some of the chains that the Enlightenment put on uh, around Western science and around uh, what we 
um, look at uh, when we think about how the world is. We've got to start re-enchanting the world we see. Um, <laughs> the challenge for science teaching is to um, help, for me as a Christian, to help my students begin to see beyond um, what's in front of them to begin to see, if you like, with not just their physical eyes, but their spiritual eyes. That's a toughie. Um, the, and doing this through uh, getting us to begin to and recover a, um, a sense of the relationality of all of creation. It's not just about you and I as persons. McGrath talks about an I-thou relationship with nature, um, riffing off um, Martin Luther's idea of relational interaction between I as subject object versus subject subject. And Maori, uh, um, all credit to them, have not lost this. Maori relate to the natural world, as I understand it, as an I thou relationship. Now, I do realize that I, I am in some respects looking at this from outside. So, um, and um, I am quite sure uh, others can give better feedback and do that. Um, and my other point is that Trinitarian theology is really the way we have to go. Now, I say that, and you would think that in a Christian school, Trinitarian theology would be there. I mean, we're Christian, Trinitarians, right? Um, well, actually, I think most of the time we're closet deists or theists or monotheists um, because we don't, well, we're Pakia. We've got race as well. The world we live in is a, you know, this, that sort of world. Um, um, and lastly, I think that another tool for moving through is by engaging with the idea of uh, Christ's self-kenosis, uh, his emptying out. In other words, we engage very humbly. We do not approach this as, um, well, I know what I'm talking about. Because actually, I don't know what I'm talking about when it comes to my brother Mali. I have to read what other people have said and I have to understand what they're saying. And I'm quite sure I'm misunderstanding the points. But um, I believe if we approach this with a humility, saying, teach me, uh, so emptying myself out of my Western approach and trying to uh, allow input, um, we will find a way through. Um, so uh, just quickly flicking through this, uh, Lerman touched on this. As I say, he basically stole all my best material and graph refers to it. There's no issue about um, science and religion intersecting. Um, I particularly like the way the graph book is about the boundaries are now um, a whole more fluid than they were, and they need to be. Uh, we need to accept that spirituality flows into uh, there's a different way of mapping uh, how we understand scientific material. Um, and uh, <clears throat> another one of the books that I have read into, um, just picking up that it's more than just the five senses. When we come to do science, we teach students to look, we ask them to think, we ask them to uh, experiment, they get called the scientific method, but actually uh, there's a, um, at the risk of sounding a bit woohoo, there's this extra sensory sort of thing going on. And even some of the greats of physical science would say that uh, this had um, underlain some of their thinking. Um, C.S. Lewis, uh, we all like to go back to C.S. Lewis occasionally. Uh, uh, I like the fact that he reflects that uh, even pagan mythology might be pointing in a certain way, and that takes back to that idea that in Christ all things hold together. If God is the God of this world, then God is the God of all of this world, and all of it will at some level speak to who God is. Um, at least that's where I'm coming from. 
Um, so consequently, um, we do live in a really weird universe, as I said, uh, where particles are reality and what was the effect. Uh, I really like modern physics and like reading about it, um, but I don't have the time to actually be actively uh, participating in it anymore. Um, but I think these, um, some of these ideas actually, uh, there's a sense where you find, you feel them coming through in um, Maori ways of thinking. Um, and here we have Marston reflecting on that. Uh, he relates a story in his book about how he was telling his elders about the, the dropping of the atomic bomb on uh, Hiroshima and how it just totally disintegrated everything to its parts. And one of his elders said, uh, something along the lines, well, that's very well, but do they know how to put it back together? Which I thought was a very interesting comment to make. But his, he gets into talking about Maori views and how they perceive the universe as a process, which, of course, we know in science. Our universe is a process. It started at the Big Bang. It has been changing and evolving ever since. Um, if, if it continues to go on, eventually, in about five billion years, our sun will blow up into a red wolf, a red giant, and uh, that will be it, post for anyone who's here on Earth at the time. Um, I'm not too worried about that. I've probably got another 30 years from here, and then it's all good. We'll see what happens after that. Um, so, uh, <coughs> For me, Marston opened up that indigenous knowledge uh, is, has something, a huge amount to offer. It's a whole other realm of knowing that isn't present in our current Western syllabus. It's been supposed to be coming in since about 2004, 2005, but it's, um, schools are like the Titanic. You know, you can shout as much as you like, there's an iceberg ahead, but they'll just continue going. Uh, big organisations for the most part, and it's very hard to shift them. Um, Walter Brueggemann is another of my uh, favourite authors uh, who has written into the areas about um, Indigenous knowledge. And what he reflects on, and I think this is very true, um, is that it's a story world. And Māori tells stories uh, to tell the knowledge of the way the world is. Uh, at least that's what I've picked up. And uh, forgive me if I'm around you, perhaps I picked that up as well. But uh, it seems to me increasingly, particularly the students I teach, I have the most profound impact when I tell them stories. And so here is yet another way in to tell them the story of the world that in, in which uh, Mato and Māori is integrated, in which we see that uh, we have the presence of God uh, holding all things together. Um, and Smith, uh, uh, this is James K. A. Smith, um, the, uh, who uh, makes that comment, but then, and this one I'm, I'm going to skip through to this, Linda Tuhuai Smith wrote this in her book, Decolonising the methodologies um, and uh, and I think she makes a very good point we, we do recognize uh, this here that the um, that there's quite a good engagement with um, Mato and Māori as far as environmental knowledge goes um, people are willing to say oh well yes the, the Māori to the phenomena that they understand about being etc uh, and so we can work with that. I don't think there is as equivalent to the level of engagement, but uh, I understand the starting it, but in the physical sciences, etc. Um, I don't know what's going on in the genetic sciences, but uh, I, would, uh, I would imagine that there has to be a very big discussion over Muslim Māori and the, the, the knowledge that is encapsulated in DNA and the Māori DNA. Who, who does that belong to? Who has the um, kaitiaka tanga, if that's the right word, for that, um, etc. But I think um, 
Linda Smith has a, a very important point to make there. And so let me move through. So Marston um, summarizes for us a, a Maori view. Uh, he, he lists these bullet points. These are basically taken verbatim out of him. I haven't tried to alter anything. Um, some of those we might as Christians want to look at and say, mm, I'm not sure about that. But we should be thinking about this. We should be engaging with them. Um, I think in my school, if I uh, try to push some of these too hard, I will be burned at the stake. Um, because uh, you look down here, uh, all is one and interlocked together. Uh, are we looking at penning here or something? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, could well be. Um, this idea of being both human and divine. Well, there is a sense where, as Christians, we could say, yes, we are human, and yes, we have imparted to us a divinity through um, God's interaction with us. Um, I don't want to try and specify exactly how one would take these, but I do think it's a point of consideration, and I think it's something we've taken up with. Um, I'm going to skip over that because uh, it's not necessary. Uh, and that too, sorry. Um, I, I always put far too much in. And so, um, forgive me, you can go back and have a look if you want. Um, this guy here, another reading I came across. Um, the, and, and again, this is something we need to take on board as a Christian school that all of our knowledge is connected and that. Uh, if we engage with um, the Māori world, then this is a key idea that uh, uh, we will find. Um, so, but we have to do it through a humble listening mode, a posture of submitting to and appreciating the various given orders of creation. Um, much to think on there. Um, so how does this work itself out in terms of what we as schools are facing? Well, up on the screen now are two statements out of the new framework of assessment that has been brought in for secondary schools. Now, our current framework is NCEA. It's made up. It's a bit like a university course these days. Uh, students take papers, we call them achievement standards, a course is made up of maybe five achievement standards, six. Some of them will be done by essays or research projects, some of them will be assessed by exams. Um, and there's a fairly standard collection of achievement standards for all the different subjects. In fact, it's quite vast and schools have been free to construct their courses as they would like. There are some constraints, particularly when you get to year 12 and year 13. However, none of those standards, apart from the ones that are specifically about Te Reo and the learning of it, have anything of muscle and Māori in it. And uh, as part of our whole national move towards recognising uh, Māori as the tongue of whenua, um, properly recognising, as opposed to getting the treaty signed by some and then we're sitting there for the next couple of years. Um, the, the Ministry of Education have finally got fed up with the MCQA who, who actually organised the writing of these standards and uh, the administering running them. They've stepped in and they've taken it away from MCQA and they have come up with and they are now in draft form new standards that will be used as the assessment instruments to measure students' learning. And these statements are taken from um, uh, one of those standards, well, some of those standards uh, that are from the physics, earth and space science. And they very specifically reference things uh, to do with Tabo and Māori. Um, these are verbatim. Um, and uh, you'll see in here the mention of certain body words, but most of it, in some respects, to me, looks awfully like what we're doing. And I, I do wonder what exactly is going to happen. However, in a Christian school, we do have 
Um, so it's like, for those who don't know, Taiao is the environment, the natural world, um, etc. Uh, or at least that's what Google Translate tells me, and, and I'm sorry because that's unfortunately where I'm at. I don't have Tavao as a language. I know the old word or two, um, but I have to uh, go back to it. Um, but I find this interesting. We have to now teach about Māori. And Māori is life force, and everything has Māori. It's not just living things, rocks can have Māori. I understand from Māori Master that it's a, a different kind of Māori, but it's still there. This, I think, is going to be very challenging for a state secular school, because that is a very religious concept. Um, I think we can engage with that in a Christian school, by engaging with the fact that our um, universe is held together by God. God is there. His very presence infuses through it. Now, I'm not a theologian, so the, the deeper I, I know I'm standing on thin ice, um, and I'm quite happy to be um, told that there are cracks in it, etc. But um, I think that. Uh, the presence and the active presence of God in the spirit, in creation. I'm not going to say that Modi is the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to say that because I could be completely wrong uh, and it's not my place to do that. And I also don't want to get into what we do in our Western ways of thinking and saying this is that. We uh, incorporate something in, and then we blithely go on, we're kind of like the Roman Empire, where we'll, we'll say, oh yeah, you've got your name for it, but we know it's this, but hey, will the you your name carry on? We'll still be the Roman Empire. I don't think that's what we need to be doing. So, anyway, uh, here are a couple of other statements. Uh, these come out of um, the science collection of things, and I think you can see that uh, they they definitely require us to engage with it. So this is this is going to be a big thing. Um, how do we go about doing that? Uh, well, as I say, I, I I think for us it lies in <coughs> God being three in one. Um, and Maltman refers to this uh, in, in tying together the Trinity in the creation process. Um, and coming to that conclusion. Um, Graf riffs off him um, and, um, <coughs> and has this statement in there and then um, right at the end of his book uh, he is um, making statements like that. Now, uh, so if anyone says, oh, come on, you're talking about atheism, all I would say is McGrath. He's gone there, I'm hiding behind him, okay? He can fall through the ice first. Um, and John Hockingham gets into what does the Trinity mean from a physicist's point of view. Now, he, he gets really quite deep into this and he tries to develop a, a theory, a physics theory, and you can see the physicist done him. He wants to know how can God be human and uh, divine at the same time in Jesus Christ? How does that work? We physicists, I, I, well, and physics teachers, want to know A plus B makes C. We want to know the cause and mechanism. I'm sure geneticists do as well. We want to have a logical, clear pathway. Well, who wants this? But he makes these statements. Our common sense notions derived from everyday experience cannot be expected to serve adequately for thinking about the profundity of God's relationship with humanity or creation generally, um, and he sees the interconnected connected things and the complexity that's present, and he's basically saying uh, we can't just do the Western thing and say this and this and this and this equals. You cannot bring that to bear and uh, I think a similar thing is present in Te Māori. We can't um, 
say, oh, well, we have this idea, so we're going to bring it in here and put it here. We need to be far more holistic in how we engage. Right, um, I'll skip through there. So just to sum up, um, my sort of key thought is that if we're going to adhere to a Trinitarian theology, and, and if you're sitting here and you don't, that's fine. I, I'm not here as a, I'm not here to try and turn you to the dark side or anything like that. Um, it's just to say that that's where uh, uh, standard Christian faith tends to come from. Um, you can't get away from the fact we are in an uncharted universe. It is kind of magic in a way. Okay, um, and Christian theology's done this for a very long time, and and here we come back to my Irish roots. I kind of feel drawn to Celtic Christianity. Why is there something lurking deep in the epigenetics, whatever, of me that's uh, taking me? I don't know. Um, modern physics discoveries are uh, definitely woohoo. Um, in all of this, Māori is not an untenable concept. And uh, those last couple of points as well, I think, are relevant. So how are we going to do this in a Christian manner? Very quickly, uh, we have to do it with humility. Um, Augustine's got a great statement about this. I won't read it to you, but I can point you to it if you like. Um, we're going to have to have science units that cross the boundaries. We can no longer be siloed, I think. Uh, certainly there are nuggets of teaching and knowledge and information we have to have, but we are going to have to do that. Um, and uh, understand that the world is, is a sacrament in some respects that points to God himself. Um, we're going to have to emphasise communal learning far more than we do. Um, you would think that at, as in teachers we would do this naturally, we do to a degree, but uh, in the end we still end up at the individual as the unit of learning or knowledge <coughs> of acquisition. We certainly do not believe in communal assessment. You can't get students communally assessed under NCA, they must all do their own assessment. And I think that's got to change somewhere. Somehow. Um, Contextualisation will have to happen in the local environment. Uh, now this has been talked about for years and you'd think it's happening, but uh, it still gets held up as, you know, I don't think it does as much. And lastly, and I think this one's crucial, but um, as I was talking with before the comment here, that the resources aren't there for us, but they need to be. We need to be led. As a Pākehā, as a non-Māori, uh, as a non-Māori school, you need to be led by um, the Kāmata Whenua, the local Māori who can start to provide that integration and that. Um, and that's a tricky place to be because that means giving up power and Power is one of those Western things which lurks behind so many interactions uh, and just, you're not even aware it's there until it flares up. So to finish, yes I am finishing. Um, McGrath made this comment um, about recovering alternative models. Now, he's a Westerner, he is Pākehā, well he would be Tōiwi if he was here, He's English, um, but he uh, thinks very deeply on this. And he makes this comment that this process of retrieval, of uh, reconnecting to the spiritual side of the created order, is not contradictory to uh, science as uh, is done. Um, it says merely there's more to nature than a mechanism placed there for our convenience. And I think for too long we have treated our natural world that way and it needs this re-engagement to happen. And I see that uh, Mato and Māori coming in 
to our assessment instruments because the ministry knows that if it's going to be tested, we'll teach to it. You know, teach to the test, still a very big thing. Um, but more than that, it starts to re engage, I think, the whole of the student with the whole of their learning, or at least I hope it would be. Thank you.